Boop, 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 boop. What up? It is Bowtie Friday. We've got a new format where we bring in a superstar guest and I shill build guild builds and do the usual Bowtie Friday thing. Today we have with us JT Riley, the uh, the one and only. I think the very first uh, one was with Matt Garnett and we talked about, we both kind of simped on you a little bit. So it's it's good to, to have you here and I can stand in real life. Uh, JT Riley, how you doing? How you feeling, man? Great, man. Great. Thanks for having me. Awesome. So so good to have you here. Uh, excited to have you on. Um, so I think just to jump right into the questions, I think one of the most exciting things uh, for me when I was talking to you earlier is about your early work in the like casino industry. And, and you've been in like fintech and you've been in the gambling industry, which is really like such a great uh, kind of base starter point for getting into Ethereum and everything beyond it. But could you uh, explain? So there's this weird threat model with the the casino. Could you explain it a little bit and kind of get into maybe how you had to think about it and think adversarially? Yeah. So, um, you know, the short version, because it, it is a little bit of a, a weird system here, but the short version was um, generally in a casino. Um, you know, players play against the house, right? So if, you know, if the player wins, the house pays out of their bank. Um, and then, you know, if the player loses, it goes to the house's bank, right? Uh, because of some weird legality things and, and stuff like that, um, you know, this, this like small set of casinos, what they would do is um, sort of like delegate that, that house role to a third party, right? So the third party handles the bankrolling and then the casino just takes a fee on, on every, uh, every hand that plays out, you know, through this, from, from the third party, right? And so um, it actually creates these really interesting incentives where, you know, if you are part of that company that does this third party thing, uh, the casino doesn't really have incentive to stop cheaters anymore, right? Like only to the extent that, you know, if we, if we lose all of our money, we leave, right? But um, it's like a very open system. Um, and so because of that, yeah, you, you have, you have these, these weird incentives of like, okay, um, you know, you have to be the one to detect mistakes. You have to be the one to detect exploits. Um, you know, you have to be the one to manage like this, this PL, right? And so there's, there's like a lot of different things that we would have to do with this, right? There's like the basic stuff, right? Just like watching, um, you know, watching a hand play out, you know, watching players that are like notorious for trying to steal chips, things like that, right? But um, it actually got deeper than this to the point that like, um, you know, like, obviously, we all know that like, uh, the, you know, the odds are obviously stacked against the players and that like trends in that direction over time. And so we can actually use like long term, like PNL tracking to see when somebody's very obviously like deviating from this, right? Now, this could be a high roller specifically, or this could be um, like, you know, generally the PNL of like a shift. Right. And so, um, yeah, it was, it was really cool. Like you have this like direct like interface to like, you know, finding these exploits and then you have this sort of like broader, like, you know, statistics driven approach. So it was, uh, it, it definitely, that kind of thinking, that sort of adversarial thinking, um, you know, definitely helps with stuff like smart contracts, right. Where, you know, people have an unbounded amount of time to break your, break your contracts. That's 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 the that's the reason why I wanted to dive into this is because uh, this this adversarial thinking uh, is exactly the kind of background that a computer scientist needs, and they sometimes don't have that. Right? They they know how to write the most optimized, uh, you know, embedded processor code. Uh, that handles memory perfectly. <laughs> They're thinking maybe adversarially in terms of like people dinking with their memory or something, uh, but they're not thinking of incentives. And I think incentives are a really good, like that keyword there, when you get in and you start learning about how to build on Ethereum and how to build these systems to be robust and hard, you have to understand incentives and where, where all the incentives are. And like you're saying, the house is not incentivized because someone else is LPing as the house, right? There's, a, there's someone else that's providing that liquidity to be the house. And that must've been some legal reason or something like that, right? Like the house wasn't allowed to LP, so they needed third parties. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was this, um, it's, it's only in like one or two States across the U S you know, and I imagine those loopholes are probably closing up, you know, soon probably. Enough, but, yep. Yep. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. The next thing I want to, uh, shill is build guild is launching officially our, our grants. And let me show this off. It looks so beautiful. The, the team has done such a good job to put this together, but I think I've added you to this page too. Yes. We've got JT Riley on there for, it was a, a small ETH, uh, uh, 
Grant for the Ether deck. Uh, a really cool, I think your liaison into uh, smart contract wallets and possibly even destroying 443. <laughs> we can we can dive into that more. But I my open ended question for you is um, has and and we will continue to provide grant funding to you as long as we can and keep you building cool things in the space. But if you could just go into um, the value of uh, an open source grant program like this and, and how it's helped you uh, getting into, the, you were already in this space very well, you were, you're famous to me, but kind of maintaining your free agency, I think is one of the keys. Yeah, um, it actually turns out Biddle, Biddle Giddle was one of, you know, sort of one of the main like sources of income over the past year, right, of like, you know, just making sure that I can, you know, sustain and, and continue to work on like the open source stuff. So it's it's been it's been hugely valuable, and I'm like beyond appreciative of it, really. And I think that was in the Jesse's Hacker House. That was here, wasn't it? Are you? Yes, you're one of these streams here, also. So along with the grant that we gave you, we we were doing like a, a streaming smart contract, and that's where I mean, look at the names on this. <laughs> There's to to me like all of these .eth names are just like hella famous. I don't know if like maybe I lurk in particular corners of the ecosystem or not. But we, we as the Build Guild, thanks to Jesse, were able to put money in this uh, contract and then it allowed all of these up and coming high impact superstar builders to withdraw as they worked on things. And if I click on yours, I can even see like, here's the cool shit that you built. And there's a lot of cool shit in here. And you're withdrawing like not very much money <laughs> and you're barely surviving. But that's, I mean, like that, when, when I can help someone on the edge barely survive, I, of course I would like to have them thrive, but at least getting everybody to survive is a good, a good starter point. So yes, so Build Guild grants are launched. Uh, if you are a Build Guild member, you can apply. If you have something big that you would like a grant for, or these are very small grants, but if you're looking for a small grant and you're not part of the Build Guild, the, the way to get in is to go speedrun Ethereum. Speedrun Ethereum is just a good uh, on-ramp into Ethereum. I don't think, JT Riley, I don't think you've gone through speedrun Ethereum. I think you said your entry point was, was Natter, maybe? Could you uh, maybe like dive into how you got into Ethereum, maybe? I think that would be a good transition. Yeah, so I guess like the first the first encounter with this was actually a poker dealer. Um, you know, way back <laughs> in the day, he was he was one of the Ethereum miners, right? So wall of FPGAs, you know, mining uh, mining. Ether. I had this in my notes, and it said like your dealer, and I was like like a drug dealer. Like I couldn't remember <laughs> like what the dealer like the context. Now it was your dealer, like a card dealer. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, the uh, the poker dealer, and he had a he had this big mining rig set up at home, and so he used to he used to show me these these like white papers to go check out right back in the day, and um, that was that was the first encounter, and then once I started taking it seriously, you know, I started looking into like how to do smart contract development, and like the first thing that came up was Natter's tutorial, I think it was called like the the full stack guide to Ethereum development or something like that, or the complete full stack guide to Ethereum development, um, and it was like. So this was actually, I think, back in the truffle days. I think we were using truffle. Ooh, this. Maybe, maybe yeah. hard hat. Maybe yeah. it was hard hat. It was like when hard hat was just like the new kid yeah. on the street, right? But um, you know, it just walks through like a little, like a little the basic stuff, right? The greeter, you know, uh, put a message in this contract and like call it, and get it back out, right? Um, and then a little React app on the side as well. Yeah. Do you do you happen to remember how uh, you digest the content? Is it? Uh, what's best for you, I think? Is it like, give me some async text that I go through, give me a video to watch, give me like a challenge that I have to test, make the tests pass? Like what works best for you in terms of that, you know, just disseminating all that information to you in a way that you understand it and remember it? You know, I think actually like, I think that changes over time. Um, you know, whenever I first got into programming, um, I was self-taught and like, I started with YouTube tutorials, right? I mean, I would, cool. I would just like code side by side with, with this uh, tutorial and basically do everything that it did. Um, and then I would kind of tinker a little bit, right? Like tinkering, tinkering is like the biggest, like, um, like the biggest driver of like those, those edge case, um, and like the edge case information that you're looking for. Um, so like tinkering in videos is how it started. Um, nowadays, like because there's a lot of like prerequisite knowledge and a lot of context around it, um, I can actually focus more on like documentation or like white papers or things like that. Awesome. 
that makes a lot of sense. Okay, so if you're like super new, you need to like kind of just go through the motions. So it's just like, I'm gonna do exactly how you do. You show me and I'll dance along with you for a while. But then once you understand the dance, it's more like, okay, I can just read a paper now to pick up like the new piece of this context or something like that. Cool, 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 cool. And you switched probably, did you, you did a little truffle because you went through then probably a little hard hat, but now you're probably mostly foundry and forge. Is that is that right? Yeah, foundry all the way. It's it's not awesome. even close. <laughs> it's awesome. uh, it's kind of tough because sometimes like I'll have to like review a code base or or like work with something that isn't a hard hat uh, yeah. thing, and then and it's like oh man, like I have to you know write a POC or write a test, and I have no idea how to write a hard hat test anymore. Right? It's just you know foundry's been my go-to for so long. And it, and it, I mean, it makes so much sense. Uh, there, there's like maybe one little pushback of like if you're gonna build a front end, you're gonna need the JavaScript anyways, and so. Uh, I, I just think that like for for me when it go when it comes to tinkering, I kind of like to have both the the smart contract and my front end and I like to make small changes and this is this is the the idea with with scaffold eth. but I also totally understand like if you write it in foundry and you write your tests in foundry and everything is solidity native, it's just much smoother from a programmer standpoint to have everything encapsulated in solidity and clear. but also eventually when you make a front end, Maybe it's separate. And I think that's what we do see with a lot of production apps is we have kind of the Solidity crew that gets it all right and gets it hard and makes it work. And then that ships and it's audited. And then later on, there's two or three different front ends that kind of get built on top of it. And I, I would guess that there's maybe like a little bit of discovery that's missed out on, but I think that's kind of the process. And that's how most like hardened apps are built at this point. Yeah, I think so. I think actually like, you know, in theory, I don't even think Foundry really goes all the way. Um, hmm. I don't think anything external to Solidity could, right? Like the the idea. Um, so this is kind of something that that um, I really wanted to really wanted to drive home with Edge, which we can we can get a little bit deeper into Edge uh, later on in the podcast. But um, you know, the idea is that um, there's really like two kinds of like two like broad classes of tests. Obviously, there's there's other small things like fuzzing and units and all that. But like from a very very high level. Right, you have like these sort of interfacing tests, right? That you know comes from those external languages for whatever's going to be interacting with this, right? But then you need these these like deep internal tests on like what what this thing is doing, right? So like ideally, that's actually just Solidity having like you know in-house test support that's built into the language, right? Like I can just kind of test something, um, you know, in, in any Solidity file. We don't really have to hack this like Foundry environment on top of it, right? Like we need this. Um, like, okay, as an example, like having to use like warp and, um, you know, prank and deal and like all these cheat codes in Foundry that kind of like mutate the environment. That's a signal that like, there, there's something that we're missing in terms of how deep we can test. Um, and I do think I actually have a solution to this. I won't, I won't show you too long on this, Ooh but um, all right. I think a second I found grant. something new to, to do with this. Yeah, yeah. So um, it's, I think the name of it right now is is type-driven tokens. Because okay. um, I just kind of started experimenting with tokens, but but um, from a sort of you know type theoretic perspective, um, a smart contract is really just a struct, like it's really just a product type where um, you know the the storage of that smart contract are just fields of that struct, and your external functions are just you know the the functions or like methods over that struct, right? And that doesn't seem like a particularly useful thing to to say, but if you if you treat it like that, and then you say, okay, how about like we take all the storage variables of this contract and we actually embed that into its own struct with some of Solidity's new syntax, like the method call syntax, right? Where you can define a type and then you can define a function and then use that function where it's like type dot function name, right? Like it's it's a very like clean way to do this. Um, you encapsulate your whole storage into um, a single struct, right? And then you have all these functions that interact with it, but you can actually decompose that into smaller components, right? You can, you can decompose this into smaller types. So as an example, like for an ERC-20, right? you might have a balances type and you might have an allowances type and a total supply type, right? Now, independently, you have some basic, you know, like read, write, you know, maybe increment, right? Decrement, whatever it may be. Um, you define those methods on each of those types and then you can compose those and those compositions are where you define your invariants, right? So the whole ERC-20 doesn't have to, you know, enforce the invariant of the total supplies, the sum of all balances. You can just have a type that is, you know, that, that basically encapsulates both the total supply and the balance and ensures that if you're interacting with these, like this is the invariant that holds, 
right? And so you, you get some you get some really neat properties when you do stuff like this, but you also, instead of having to sort of like build the whole contract and then go into Foundry and take this contract and throw like external functions at it and mutate your environment and all of that, if you define your your um, your methods on this type in a relatively pure way, right? So you don't you don't have to rely on just like you know let's say timestamp or caller that can sort of be arguments to that that data type, um, like that allows you to actually t test that data type in isolation first, right? So you can test all of these nested data types. You can test the way they compose, right? And then you can do that sort of external test where you're like calling into the contract and, and trying out things like that. Um, and obviously ERC-20 is pretty, pretty trivial, but if you take the entire logic of an ERC-20, but then you put that in a mapping, now you get ERC-1609 for free, right? And so you just get like these really cool like type composition things. So I'll definitely be writing, writing more about this soon. And, and the goal is testing though. The goal is making your tests easier to write and making the code that you're writing less possible for error. Is that, is that right? Like the goal of the whole thing that like the, the special typed based abstraction that you're doing here, is, is it security? Is that like the reason? Is it, it, it's not like easier to write or anything, is it? It's probably harder to write, but also like harder to make any errors. Am I thinking of it right or maybe not? I think good testing was like um, an unintended consequence. I didn't realize okay. that actually it would make tests like a lot more thorough, but where it actually came from was like, I mean, I've been saying inheritance bad for a while, right? <laughs> and we can kind of go into why later, you know, I don't want to like take up too much time on it, but I think like inheritance actually is like the way that it's generally used in Solidity smart contracts is not good. You get these like very deep, like very complex inheritance trees that don't really make a whole lot of sense. And I have to open like six files to, um, you know, see like what this thing is doing. Right. And so, um, and, and, and like, you don't even know what the external interface is to this, right? Like you, you have no idea what functions exist on this contract because of this inheritance. And so the idea with this was like, how do we do code reuse and modularity without inheritance? Right. And so one of the, one of the cool things about this like type driven system is that you can have your entire external interface and a single contract. And the internal, you know, like the body of each of these like external functions are just like a handful of like methods that operate on the storage struct, right? Like it's just, it's a much more clean way of like, you know, here's here's the entire interface. Um, if you want to drill into the implementation details of each type, you can, but generally, you know, I'm, I'm building these like, um, oh, what's what's the word? The sort of like idiomatic, like declarative, you know, API over these data declarative. types is what I'm shooting for. Yeah. And yeah. you're calling it type-driven tokens right now? Is that right? Yeah, yeah, I need to come up with a better name for it. Um, but yeah, that's the that's the GitHub repo. Awesome, awesome. I'll keep an eye out for it. That's that's good stuff. It's always great to have folks like you innovating on weird things that are. I think in our notes, I have the word unhinged written a few times. But you experimenting with slightly unhinged new ways of writing code is always exciting. And you, you kind of you were on stage at DevCon uh, talking through Edge, which we'll talk a little bit later. Uh, about, but I think one of the best characteristics is it's slightly unhinged. Is that is that right? Do you do you bring an unhinged nature to your your uh, your syntax building? What's uh, what's up with unhinged? Do you think it's uh, it's valuable? I do, I do. So I think like in in the context of developers, I think you have like um, developers that just want to ship something. You know, they don't they don't really care about the implementation details. They just want to like you know take whatever Open Zeppelin's got or what T11s wrote or what Vectorized wrote and just kind of like put it in the prod. Good shout outs. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Shout out to those guys. They're they're killer devs. But um, like it's like you have devs that just want to like get the shit done, and then you have people that really want to experiment and like try the unhinged stuff. Right? They want to optimize the hell out of things. They want to um, you know, they want to try some like unconventional patterns, whatever it may be. Right. And so the, the whole idea behind edge was like, we should be optimizing for, for like allowing people to be as unhinged as they want, but still have a reasonably type checked sandbox to do that in. Um, and then sort of have that extensibility and modularity that kind of allows people to have those like one line or two line or imports, you know, like Im import this thing and, and, you know, just, just call this, call this function and you get your contract. Right. Um, these two, these yeah. two sides that reminds me of, uh, when I was getting my pilot's license, I was afraid of flying first of all, like, and when, when I would get in the plane, it would be like, all right, I'm going to go up. We're going to circle around. I'm going to get back down. Like, that's going to be what I'm like, what I'm doing here. <laughs> I'm definitely like bringing in open Zeppelin. I don't want, I don't want to do anything, uh, unhinged or scary, but my flight instructor was talking about how. The weather was looking a little weird and we might get like ice on our wings 
And all of a sudden, when we start talking about having ice on our wings, there are two or three other pilots that are like jumping in their plane and going to take off to go experience it. Right. And I'm like, no, 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 I'm just going to import open Zeppelin, man. I, I'm not trying to get ice on my wings, but it's that, that, that unhinged, um, angle to exploration and to learning that I think gets us like farther out on the edge and helps us figure out and learn new things. I, I think that we, you'll find that in all walks of life, but adding a little unhinged to it, uh, I think is a good spice of life. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. Definitely. So format for Bowtie Friday is I shield you some builds from the build guild and you maybe pick a favorite, but I think maybe last time we had like a best technical implementation and biggest impact so maybe you could have an impact score and a technical score here but let me let me show you some builds uh from the build guild we uh let's see will this just play yes so we started with jacob who created <laughs> this like trash nft where it was uh so it's a it's a, it's a not ERC 404, and we can really dive into the ERC 404. It's something that I think uh, will spark a great conversation with you. Uh, but he, they're doing it to release a, an album, and the album would be, I think, I think there was the trash, which is like the ERC 20, and as you collected more and more of the 20, you got one of the 721s, and maybe the 721s were the song, but the the album was its own. I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was using 404 in its construction of these like cool trash art pieces to represent uh, a an album and you could collect the songs within the album. And then I think there might have been uh, another mechanism where there was another like trash can NFT and you could like throw away your trash and get another NFT. It's kind of like just dinkering around with composability, but also this cool like kind of releasing uh releasing a song or an album in this 404 format but let's just let's let's dive into the 404 first right i think we should just pause everything and talk about 404 for a little bit just because it's like such a, a interesting topic in the space as someone who has gone through the erc process and knows how shitty and hard it is hit us with it man erc 404 love it or hate it where you at uh, 404 man <laughs> god what a what a what a thing you know um so i guess the, the tldr for for people that that kind of aren't in the loop Please. on this um i mean surely that's that's not the case but um yeah basically you know they kind of just uh sort of frankenstein the erc20 and erc721 interfaces together um turns out uh the interfaces actually collide on the transfer function on the um transfer event I think the, I might be wrong. I think a proof might be there. I forget the exact interface of 721, but there's a couple different collisions there, right? And so basically what they did was just kind of like, you know, throw in this this logic of like, okay, if the amount that you're trying to transfer is less than the max token ID, then, you know, just, just transfer the NFT instead. Uh, and then if it's above that threshold, just transfer like an ERC20 form of this, right? Now I don't even know fully how like all these balances and things are managed. Same. Um, it was you know it was launched as a grift and this really, like, this is people... it's how it's launched yeah this is the thing to talk about is they did not go through the erc process at all they just named their token an erc 404 which didn't even sit sit right with the naming convention right like normally there's this can you can you talk about maybe the erc process a little bit yeah okay so i I think like there, there's like there's like three things wrong here, right? One is like the, the like very personal one, which is like you know I built uh, ERC sixteen hundred nine, which is like a multi token. It allows like you know variable like fungibility and things like that. Um, and so like it literally does exactly this, just with like a slightly different interface and you know a bit more optimized than what eleven fifty five can do. So that's obviously like personally that hurt a little bit, you know. But um, I think like you know the the other like major thing is that obviously like. The implementation details are kind of silly, right? Like it's it's kind of you know it's it's it wasn't built to be a very serious thing. It was just kind of like oh let's throw like you know an ERC name at this and like see where that goes. And that by going through the to, ERC uh, process, they would have gotten feedback from GigaBrains. Hey, careful! Your implementation is a little loose here. You could do this instead of this. But by not going through the ERC process, they didn't get that level of feedback. So their implementation is janky without having any changes or iterations. Is that maybe a piece here? 
Yeah. So, so number three is definitely like this, this ERC process thing. Right. And this actually like, so this is around the time that I kind of took my break away from Twitter. I took a long drive across the U S and like really like thought through, like, why do I even give a shit? Like who cares? Right. Um, like it seems like most people don't, um, it will probably be dead in a week and a half. Right. Just, you know, why, like why even bother with it? And so I really had to think through this, right. Like obviously on the practical side, it's good to get feedback from other people and yada, yada. And like, I, like I get like as a company, if you don't want to deal with that, you just want to kind of throw it out there. Like, sure. Um, but I think like the, the broader problem here, right. That I have with this is that like the ERC process only works if social consensus agrees that it does right like every, everything in blockchain everything that we're building all of these systems of like oh look this can enforce this rule or that rule none of it matters if social consensus does not agree with that right like that's that's where the you know that's where it stops is, is social social consensus and so like if we can just agree that um you know people can just kind of launch ercs without going through any like formal process without doing anything like um you know without without going through this like I mean, frankly, like it, it is kind of annoying. It's a little slow, right? But there's a reason for it, right? Not just for the sake of getting that feedback, but also like, you know, we need to know like, like, like all of DeFi and all of NFTs and all of everything that we've built here does not happen without standardization, right? We need like a good process for forming these standards, right? Like everybody has these like requests for comments, right? All the way, all the way up to like the internet layer, right? Like the, the protocols of the internet have a similar like, system. Um, I don't know how ideological those are. Those are probably even more ideological than these, but um, you know, there's a reason that we do these things and like 404 just kind of like didn't care. It was like, ah, like, you know, fuck it. We'll just take the the branding around the ERC process and slap it on this and call it a new standard. Right. And, and enough people kind of bought in that like, what, what does it matter if I'm shouting about it on Twitter? It kind right? of, like, yeah, that's right. It has to get Lindy and get noticed and get used and get the social consensus, right? S somehow they kind of got a little social consensus without going through the process, which is fucked. <laughs> I agree. But yeah. they still were able to do it, which I mean, the fact that Jacob used this in his thing. And immediately I was like, use DN404, not ERC404, at least so we get away from the naming uh, I think it was maybe the pop punk folks or some of those guys. Maybe it was Saigar. I think you even argued with him a little bit that they tried to almost like vampire it a little bit and be like, hey, we we can build the same thing, but we can make it less. We can clean up some gas to make it worth your while. And then we can rename it so it's not using that ERC. Uh, have you have you changed your views at all on the DN404 or do, are you still like even by in acknowledging this, this kind of props up their ERC 404, EIP 404. Yeah, I actually kind of sat down with these guys like IRL and, and chatted about this for, for quite a while because it was it was a long in discussion, Denver? right? It's like, uh, yeah, in Denver. Cool. And, you know, I, like, I, it's like I get where they're coming from in that, like, you know, yeah, like, like vampire attacking like a grift community, like, you know, it's <laughs> whatever right that should be you a know, sport like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah but i think at the same time like it's 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 a problem of like it is truly validating for this right that like some of the best engineers like like the best like some of the best smart contracts engineers smart contract engineers like in the world put their minds toward this right um and that like that carries weight right and and this is this is kind of something that that i spoke with with uh with Saigar in particular because it's like um, I mean, I don't know about them, right? I can't speak for them on this, but you know, for me, like it just, like it kind of just felt like one day I woke up and like people care what I have to say on Twitter, right? Like, you know, it just all of a sudden people, you know, are like, oh shit, like that's really cool. You, you did this thing. I agree with this. I disagree with that, right? It's like, oh, like, you know, whenever whenever you like kind of kind of come up in this space and you have this like influence in this space, it's not always obvious at first, but like, you know, those actions have like serious consequences, right? Like. The things that I do and the things that I put my time into and the things that I talk about, like that that carries weight in this space. And especially for these guys that I mean they have they have huge names, they have huge followings, right? Like um, like even some people, right? Like Harrison almost have like this cult following at this point, right? People for love real. the stuff that he posts, you know. Yeah. So it's like in a sense, like um, yeah, it's just it, it's like very validating for the community. And the community was like obviously the Pandora community was really mad about it, and there was a lot of like fighting back and forth on this and um, a lot of it pulled down to like, guys, look, like we're, we're better than this, right? Like not just like this 404 thing, but like we're better than sitting here arguing with people that are very obviously grifting. Like they'll be gone in a couple of weeks. Like we have really important shit to build, you know?
that is one thing I can attest to is they will be gone like the grifters. It's crazy how this space oscillates and there are definitely periods of where's everybody? Where is everybody? Where are all the grifters? They're gone. It's just like a bunch of quiet builders in the, in the bear market. And then it starts to ramp up and all the grifters start flowing in again. It definitely, but, but you're to your point, like they'll be gone. Like I bet they won't be here in six months. And Hopefully, uh, this other standard is better. But even by making the standard in the first place, th there's 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 some complexity there, I think. And um, you know, I I still say hats off to Saigar and Harrison for trying to do a, a vampire attack. I'm not as hardcore against it all as you are, uh, but also <laughs> I'm not as smart as you, so I respect your decision very much. So, okay, well, let's get back to shilling though. I've got another one to shill to you. Uh, we had the the 404 from uh, Jacob that was kind of like a an album that of trash art that you could trash. All right, our next scaffold ETH build is Code Chef. Oops, what I do? There we go. There's Code Chef. So Code Chef made uh, uh, it's kind of like this casual garden game where you uh, get a plot of land. And I think your plot of land is a 6551. So it's like a NFT that owns other things. It's like a smart contract instantiation of it. And you can send stuff to that smart contract. And I think what he's doing is he has this in-game currency where he's able to buy a garden and then plant some seeds and then he kind of like grows his plants to different levels it's a it's a very like casual gamer kind of thing and it looks like he expands his garden and grows some more there was a really funny part where each garden is let's see if we can see the link let me go back a little bit each garden is its own smart contract and so you can go to there we go we can see in the url there he, he goes to a certain URL and he like steals someone else's uh, plants. So basically it's like fully open casual gaming garden where anyone can go to anybody else's garden and plant things and pull things. So definitely uh, we're not thinking very adversarially here, right? <laughs> Code Chef has not run his own casino where he had to uh, protect LP funds before. But uh, this is just a good example of a nice casual on-chain game. All right, the next one, super weird, Stevie Wonder, uh, Keshav, who does not know who Stevie Wonder is, which I think is the funniest thing about all of this. <laughs> so so Stevie, Stevie Wonder, the artist, is a blind, uh, like, pianist and uh, a great, you know, great performer. Uh, but for some reason, I think he picked Steve as in the Minecraft Steve and he just <laughs> like and wonder and put them together so what what you get is you get you get a naked stevie wonder uh nft <laughs> and so your <laughs> your naked stevie wonder nft is an on-chain svg uh 6551 nft so you can send money to your uh naked stevie wonder but you can also send gear like pants and hats and shoes and then your stevie wonder can equip those and so what it really is like is almost like a wallet that you can bedazzle right it's kind of a bedazzle wallet in a in a funny naked stevie wonder theme even though he doesn't know who stevie wonder is we had this whole conversation afterwards he's like yeah it just kind of happened that way <laughs> and i just love that about this project okay let me see. Uh, let's see if there's anything else there. Okay. So, and you're thinking uh, technicality, who, who's got the most technically hard project and who's got the project that's going to have the most impact so far. And we've had Jacob with the uh, not 404 and we've had Code Chef with the garden. And now we have Keshav with the naked Stevie Wonder. And I've got two more for you. Uh, the next one is Port. So Port had this idea. It was really, it was a really quick build. Uh, Port, uh, noticed like Zach in chat being like, hey, I wish we had like a little utility that lets us put in some kind of input token. And then uh, the code would automatically convert that to a lot of different things. Like we could say, what is one ETH worth right now? And it would be like this much USDC, this much of this token, this much of this token, just like a nice little conversion display utility. And that's what he built. Let me see if I can get a a uh, screenshot of it here. There we go, right there. It kind of looks like this, kind of convert ETH. So you put in an amount and you put in a currency and then it just gives you all these like boxes underneath that explain like what you could swap that to. 
And I'm pretty sure he's working in like a little button that lets you just pick that and go do the swap too. But it's just like a little conversion app that helps you, you know, just like visually see what one of one is worth versus other uh, other currencies, other tokens. And we have lots of little apps like this. Uh, shout out to Port. Uh, we have address.vision is one. We have abi.ninja is one. We have hackedwalletrecovery.com. We have lots of little utilities. And this is the kind of thing that kind of pops up out of the build guild a lot. Uh, and last one was Carlos. So this one is a little bit different. This was their hackathon project at uh, ETH London. ETH ETH Global London, right? We got to get the branding right. But they made, they, they used the old uh, 95 theme and they made uh, like an account abstraction, like operating system. And the way this works is it lets you, uh, first of all, it uses dynamic for embedded wallets and email wallets. So for people who don't even want to F around with self custody at first, they can just get in and use this app. But also if you want to connect your wallet, you can if you have a self custody wallet. But the, the key piece of this app is you get this like the desktop and you can add any dApps to this desktop and what it's doing behind the scenes. Oh, okay, first we're logging in here. Let's go ahead and see like email login. But then you have these dApps that let you iframe in the dApp. So from the operating system page, you can pick any app that you want to interface with and look how it iframes it in. So see how we're, we're interfacing with PancakeSwap as our uh, dynamic address in an iframe. And when we do the swap, it bubbles that up to the dynamic. So this allows you to bring in any dApp in the ecosystem and interface with it with your uh, kind of your account abstraction wallet. And I think this, like, this user interface is close to what it might be like to interface with account abstraction wallets in the future, right? We don't see a lot of people building smart contract interfaces yet. Almost all of them are still like connect your MetaMask to interface with this thing, right? It's not like you have a smart contract wallet over here and we're going to work up some call data to do a swap and then you're going to propose that to your smart contract wallet. That user experience just isn't there yet. So I love to see people experimenting with this in this in this range. Okay, that's the whole shill. There we go. Let's let's <laughs> let's get that out of there. Thank you to all the Build Guild builders. All right, JT Riley. We've got uh, we've got Jacob's arcade uh, run trash art. We've got Code Chef's garden. We've got Keshav's naked Stevie Wonder. We've got Port's token converter UI, and we've got Carlos and Company shipping uh, Dyna OS. Uh, what's your what's your favorite in terms of technicality, and what's your favorite in terms of impact in the space? You know, I think actually maybe technicality and, and impact might have to go to DinoS because that's the whole that's thing they get in. Darn it. <laughs> yeah, I feel like that's uh, kind my, of a, yeah, it was like a hack of them. Please, please go, go, go. Yeah, no, I, I will say like um, the, the garden thing, like conceptually, I like the direction. Um, I think there's like two ways you could kind of go about this, right? Like one is like you could do some kind of like ZK, like dark forest type system, maybe something like that. Um, I guess that would fully conceal it. Maybe if there's a way to like leak some information, right, by the rules of the game, that would be cool. Or maybe yeah. something like you know a harbinger system, right, where like you know all of your all of your flowers are like up for auction, right, and like you could you could kind of like you know pull those, and there'd be some be some cool maybe dynamics that come out of that. But I think definitely Dino OS is is the one that stands out. Is like, um, you know, yeah, I, I think like. I think if AA actually comes to pass and we actually get these like really good like standards for how we do AA and things like that, I think actually like, um, I think it can like pretty radically shift the way that we like interact with, with smart contract accounts to the point that it's like almost not recognizable, right? And I think actually like, um, especially things like games, like this, this is the thing that I think a, a lot of, you know, blockchain games that I've seen in my time kind of get wrong is that like, the best blockchain game is a blockchain game where you don't know that it's a blockchain game, right? Like you, you, that, that, that kind of thing should be on the back end, right? It's something that like, you know, a user really shouldn't even be aware about, you know? So yeah, For definitely, sure. definitely like the direction on that one. Awesome. I, I, I like the idea of thinking about AA wallets and how to interact with them. You, you've built uh, the ether deck, right? Which is a similar smart contract wallet with modularity. Have you thought about front end at all yet? Like what what does the front end look like this thing? Or is it something as a builder where you're like, someone else will figure that out? Like what's the what's your what are you thinking about front ends and how to make that UX work? 
Yeah, so for, for now, it's actually like the only way to really interface with it is, I mean, you could go through Etherscan, but really the only way to interface with it right now is through, um, is through like a Foundry like scripting CLI, essentially. Like, you know, Foundry scripts allow you to kind of interact with, with uh, you know, smart contracts in the wild. And so it's just like a handful of things there, which that's really nice. But yeah, I think it definitely like doesn't get adoption without a good web UI. Um, I think the problem, right, is that like, Smart con like you said, like smart contract wallets are not something that we're building for yet. A lot of it is just connect with MetaMask, right? And that's, um, you know, it, it, it works, but it, it really breaks things for um, these sort of smart contract accounts. And, you know, of course, Safe has like an SDK, right? And I'm sure there are like easy ways to like hook a Safe wallet into things like that. But I don't know how compatible that is with like non-Safe interfaces. Um, the Ether deck was kind of built as an alternative to, actually it was built as a direct like alternative to, to safe because I like, I'm, I'm not reading through all that code. The code's right? scary. Like, the, yeah. It's, as yeah, Lindy it's, as it's, it is, it goes on forever. And there's a lot of, uh, like a lot of scary delegate call stuff going on in there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, that, and that, that's kind of like the, the motivation, right. For the, for the Ether deck, at least the Mark two, the Mark one was in hop. It was like this weird M of N monstrosity, but. Um, you know, the Mark II is really just like a single accounts, like smart wallet. And, you know, all it does is like run a call or do that in batch because that's really like the big value add for, for smart contract wallets. And then it's got some extensibility, right? That allows you to like assign mods and that's a delegate call, right? But it only happens on fallback. And of course, all of the mods can be like authenticated and stuff like that. I think this is a good thing just to hint on uh, for the audience to understand what we're even talking about here. Like if... EOAs just aren't going to work for everyone. There's this elephant in the room with EOAs where if you lose your PK, it's gone forever. If you leak your PK, it's swept forever. We need things like, I, I need to still be able to like reset my account. I still need to be able to uh, like roll an account out, right? And you just can't do that with an EOA without like some like multi-party computing underneath it or something like that. So eventually the space is going to have smart contract wallets. Smart contract wallets will be where you will keep most of your crypto. You will probably use EOAs to interact with those, but they will be more like sessions or signer wallets. Uh, but right now when you go to Uniswap and you go to do a swap, it, you connect your wallet and it's usually an EOA, but maybe it's a smart contract wallet. You can, but when you go to swap a token to ETH, there's a two-step process here where you have to approve the, the contract to take the token with one transaction, and then you have to execute the transaction. And for the user, if you're using a smart contract wallet, let's say it's even like a multi-sig where you have to get multiple signatures, you go to Uniswap, you get the approved transaction, you get all your signers together to sign the approved transaction, you execute the approved transaction, you go back and then finally the UI updates and says, okay, now you're ready to swap. And then you do all that again to swap. And with smart contract wallets, this will all be batched, right? It'll, it'll, it's going to say you're going to need to do an approve, you're going to need to do a transfer, and maybe even some other steps in between or after and before. And all you're going to have to do is just sign this one thing or get your crew together to sign once. And the UI straight up on Uniswap does not support this yet. So if you have a smart contract wallet, you have to do this whole dance. So it's almost going to, the onus is going to be on all of these dApps to somehow start building their front ends to like work with batch transactions somehow and to let you like sign off on an approve without the chain actually still seeing it. And the way we see people do this now is with like fake RPCs. They take Uniswap, they point it at their own fake like Flashbots RPC that makes you think that you just approved it, but you didn't yet. But then the, that lets the UI update and lets you do the transfer all in one, but these are all hacks. And there's no one that's really doing this UI and UX yet but it's a great thing for new developers to be experimenting with. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I think the, the the two like massive like value adds here, right, is like one being able to change out keys either through, you know, like you said, social recovery, if you like mess up or, you know, like we're gonna need post quantum cryptography like sooner rather Ooh, than later, right? Yeah. Like it's, yep. um, it's definitely not there yet. It's, there's a long way to go, but like it is progress and you know, it's like, you know, people are starting to be aware of this and people are starting to work through like, how are we going to, you know, how are we going to change these? And like, 
this is going to be like a, a big thing for all of these blockchain networks. We're all going to have to change because elliptic curves aren't going to cut it. Right. So you're so, saying your EOA uh, will literally like be backdoored eventually, and we will need new curves to be able to fight uh, kind of the oncoming quantum computing uh, era. Is that right? Am I thinking of it right? Don't we have to like um, extend the whole chain? Like what, what all has to change? Like what, what's going to, where's that going to go? I, I think the only way that this works, I guess there's maybe two ways, right? One is like, you know, we do this sort of like backwards compatible upgrade where people can keep their EOAs and like eventually they're just going to get wrecked or, you know, we do some kind of hard fork, right? Now the problem with doing it the hard fork way and like kind of doing this more like uh, belligerent way is like Starknet did this a while back and that did not go well, right? And they started like fresh that... and they proved that it would work, but not not enough people. Yeah, this was with the Argent guys who knew a ton about smart contract wallets and account abstraction and everything. They did it right, but they didn't get enough users, right? Sorry to interrupt you, but it's such a good critical point. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. it's, it's going to be like, it's going to be a hard migration. No matter what it is, it's going to be really hard. And something that I think is like, kind of not talked about enough is like, you know, ZK is like this, the hailed as this thing that, that can like hide this information, right? Like all of this cryptography we're building like a huge amount of our systems on and building a lot of assumptions on it. But like, you know, quite a bit of the ZK stuff is going to be broken, like, like retroactively, right? Like if, if you have like a tornado cache, right? Or some kind of mixer and it relies on, you know, th there's this kind of like obviously different like uh, schemes for like ZK, right? Not all of them are, um vulnerable to this this uh like quantum computing but there are some that are the ones that rely on these elliptic curves are um and yeah it's it's kind of like uh you know it's it's broken like starting like now right like we can we can take all of that and like we can break that at any point in the future and it kind of like de-anonymizes a lot of this stuff so um there's yeah there's a lot of scary stuff coming so we're gonna need to be able to change you know on the fly like pretty quickly uh one way or another smart contract wallets are great to do that um, and then the other one is really like atomicity, right? It's like, you know, doing these huge amounts of batches. Um, and this is actually somewhere where I think 40 through 37 goes wrong is because they put like so many restrictions on like what the user op, like what the user ops in a single bundle can do. Um, and I don't think that's the right way to go about it. Like I get where they're coming from. I get the direction of like, oh, like what if this happens? What if there's a race condition? What if ordering the bundles, um, you know, one way breaks, but the other one doesn't, right? Well, um, kind of the assumption that I've picked up from the ERC is that like, this is eventually going to be just delegated to block builders anyway, like not officially, right. It's not, it's not a part of the protocol, but it kind of uses a similar like mempool system and it is sort of enshrined in a way. Um, but the assumption is that like sophisticated block builders will, will go and, and execute, you know, these, these things and they'll, they'll run them. But like, you know, thinking about like how block builders operate now is like you have hundreds of transactions, right? And through all of these transactions, they're, they're trying out all these different orderings, right? To maximize profit as a block builder, you have to like try out as many combinations of transaction orderings as possible for a given block to like maximize your output, right? Because, um, you know, maybe, maybe none of these transactions actually, you know, does anything useful to you particularly, but um, like MEV transactions tend to bribe the block builder, right? So, um, you know, obviously putting the ones that bribe up first makes sense, but what if two of them depend on the same condition and they both only pay if that condition is met, who pays more, right? Like there's all this simulation you have to do. Um, and so it, it seems kind of odd to make the assumption that like block builders wouldn't be sophisticated enough to handle race conditions and user op bundles. And maybe I'm missing something there, but I do think that that's like a pretty, um, a pretty reasonable like way to handle that. Um, you know, just I wish I knew enough about it to argue. <laughs> my, <laughs> yeah, my 4A, I, I have not, I don't even know that much about 437. Like, I understand the entry contract and kind of how they're doing this, uh, like signature stuff, but I really don't know enough about it to even argue about it. <laughs> we'll, we'll see where it goes, right? It seems like there's, there's the 4337 stuff. There's maybe even some kind of like protocol changes that might come in to enshrine EOAs. Well, We'll see how all of that works, but I want to kind of like move away from that for a little bit. And I want to get to uh, your work on edge. I I'd love to talk more about edge. I'd love to talk uh, more about the foot guns uh, from, was that, well, that was from 4844, wasn't it? I think the foot gun conversation, the foot. Nuke. Oh, that was uh, 1153. Yeah. That yeah, was 1153. Transition. Let's talk, let's talk about that next. If you don't mind, Could, you want to give us a little background on that? Oh, God, man, this is uh, <laughs> he needs like a this beer, is another right? one, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that means I'm asking the right yeah, questions yeah. at least. 
yeah, this one was this one was pretty wild. So a little bit of context. Um, ERC 1153 is transient storage. It's basically um, it, it behaves in a similar way to persistent storage in that every contract gets their own. It's basically a hash map of a U-256 to a U-256. Um, and the, the key difference is that transient storage only lasts for the transaction, right? So you have a block. Within that block, you have a transaction. That's where transient storage persists. Within that transaction, you can have these sort of like, you know, call frames, right? These, you know, calling out to contracts, contracts calling contracts, et cetera, et cetera. Um, All it makes really me think of things. is like reentrancy guard. It makes me think I can have a reentrancy guard uh, that I put in once, and for the rest of the execution, that reentrancy guard is going to block anybody from getting in, even if it's a second person coming in in some kind of batch, which is a little weird. But yeah, <laughs> go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. So so essentially, like what? So like why this is useful, right? Is like we were already doing transient storage before, but with persistent storage, right? If you ever look at like the gas cost of like persistent storage, it's like. I mean, it's spaghetti code, right? Like there's a lot of conditions. Um, some of those come from the need for transient variables that only persist for a single transaction. But some of that also comes from, you know, MEV bots kind of abusing the fact that you get a refund on storage, uh, you know, storage deletions, right? And um, kind of abusing that during gas wars, right? So um, there's there's like a whole bunch of different reasons, but it's, it's a big mess. And so the idea was like, what if we break out instead of doing that logic and just having people use, you know, this persistent storage and just kind of flip the switch on and off every transaction, why don't we just do transient storage, right? Um, and so, you know, essentially what this is, is like it's just a much cheaper version of storage that just lasts for the transaction. A reentrancy guard is like the simple case. That's the one we kind of like broadcast because it's easy to like, you know, reason about. Um, it basically just says like, when you start executing this function, a transient variable, locks that function. This is sort of like a mutex for, for the Rust devs out there. It locks this external function so that no other function that gets called in, inside of here, like no no external contract that gets called can call back into the function while it's executing, right? The function has to finish executing, and then at the bottom, we free the lock, right? Um, that's, that's the easy one, right? But there's also other really cool things like having context information, right? Like if you're building something mm -hmm. like a DEX, you could have this sort of transient um, stack right where you know you you have like each each piece of the stack is like locking another pool right so you, you lock a pool let's say for like an amm um and and like within that lock you've kind of snapshotted like what are the pool balances at this point i can send tokens in and now we can see the balance deltas right we can take those balance deltas and do swap logic off of that right so um there's like a lot of really cool things like that there's good context information i could go on for a long time but um yeah basically like it's it's really really cool for things like context things like mutexes right um, you know, it, it's, I think, I think it's a pretty powerful EIP, but it's been under, it had been under discussion for like, my God, like seven years or something. It's been around for a very, very long time. Um, it was originally coined, I think Moody was one of the original ones to do this. Moody, and he's shout one of out. The, he was, yeah. Yeah. Shout out. Moody, Moody's pretty cool dude. Um, and so like, it was something that like the Uniswap team had kind of picked up and that they were championing because they realized like, you know, you can actually use this for, um, some pretty, some pretty like high performance stuff when it comes to like DEX design, right? Um, and I won't get into this too much here, but I think gas optimization and DEXs actually improves improves like user welfare, LP welfare, like it improves the experience for everybody through market efficiency. Um, but yeah, so so like they basically just wanted to make like a more efficient you know, system in this DEX. And I think what it was was like, I think somebody at Uniswap mentioned in passing it might not have been from uniswap but somebody that's mentioned right in kyc or something right yeah something it was like oh like as yeah. an example it could be used for kyc right and like that came back <laughs> to haunt everybody that wanted this, this eip right fast forward a couple of years um i'm at uh devcon i think six in bogota and like a couple of a couple of people like somebody from i think uniswap and and i think there was somebody from optimism as well um like just you know they they basically just came up and they're like hey we want you to like talk about like transient storage right um, right it was it was uh, Sarah and Mark so um, they uh, they were like yeah like we'd love for you to come talk about this you seem to like you know like the CIP uh, let's like talk about it it's like a thing where we can talk with the core devs um, and this did not go well right like they, they those two kind of made their argument and it was like whatever whatever you know but like they were together I wasn't like with them I was just like you know yeah sure I'll, I'll come here and talk about the EIP I want right. They go to the next guy, the next guy talks about some other EIP, can't remember what it is. And then they come to me and then like, what EIP do you want to see implemented? And I was like, I'd really like 1153, right? Because like the company I was working with at the time could actually also directly use this. And like, before I could say anything else, I got cut off by one of the guys. They're like, okay, no, no. They like took the mic. They're like, you're just hijacking governance. Like, you know, we're, we're done. We're done talking about this and passes it to the next guy. 
And I was like, no way that just happened. Like that just happened on camera live in front of like all of these people. Like I was, I was furious at that. Yeah. So like at that point I was like, okay, like they this set is you just... up to fail. It seems like, right. They set and you up. I think, I Maybe think I messed up. Fair. I probably should have just like, I probably should have just like spoken whenever they spoke, you know, just kind of like jumped in and, and said my piece then. Um, so I guess that was a mistake on my part. But like yeah, how to play what? things um, super cool. No one ever play in, 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 in retrospect, how to play things cool. No one does it that way though. So what, what happened? What yeah. what'd you do? Punch a guy? Yeah. So <laughs> that actually like, I've even, I've even made nods to that in the past, right? Like I, I put this, uh, I put up this tweet a while back that was like, you know, yeah. an ERC is like a basic discussion about an interface and every once in a while somebody says like add a callback. Right. But the IP discussions are like psyops and cultural warfare and getting cut off by EIP devs. Right. Or um, Ethereum devs. Right. Cause it's, yep. it's tough. Like EIPs are a totally different game from ERCs. Right. Um, and I kind of realized this, that the first time that it, it got pulled from Shanghai and I don't remember all the exact reasoning for it. Um, you know, maybe maybe there was more stuff behind this, right? But there were there were a couple of people, which I won't even name names. I'm not even going to give them the validation of this. But they kind of started this like FUD campaign of like, oh, like Uniswap is like they've like hijacked like Ethereum governance. Um, you know, they're forcing the CIP through because they want to do KYC on chain. So they can KYC. Right? Transient storage yeah. is going to enable that, right? And obviously, it doesn't. Like that was just an example mentioned in the forum years ago, and like you know, they're still not doing it. Um, and even without transient storage, people have made little KYC hooks. You know, just as an experiment. So like it, it just seemed like a very like strange way to go about um, you know psyoping this and you know everybody has their reasons but um, that kind of made me realize like okay like actually like the sentiment was very very negative around transient storage that time around so it kind of gave me the notion that like okay like it's not just about the technical details again social consensus is like where it stops like that's that is the end all be all. And so there's actually like value add in like shit posting and like psyop campaigns, the right? The psyops work. Um, yeah. 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 Like this was like, um, so this, this guy, uh, I think Agus that might, I don't know if that's the right way to pronounce that, but this, this guy oh, came yeah. along, um, not long before this thing got included. And he was like, yo, this actually can break all of our AA work. Um, if people like actually behave through, through the sort of incentive here, right. Of, of the way the CIP works. Um, this is where the TLDR the comes in and right this yeah yeah he called nuke. it a foot nuke yeah. um yeah. but yeah the, the tldr on like their argument was that like in erc 4237 um uh, because everything happens in one transaction all the user operations that happen um you could have a person at the top of the bundle like you know call some contract that sets a transient storage variable now because it gets dropped at the end of the transaction there's not really incentive to uh like drop the variable manually right it, it would cost i think 100 gas to like drop the variable um and otherwise it's like you're saying you basically know. unlock the thing when you're when you're done using it you kind of do a little unlock that lets the next person use it but if this is in a batch you may not as the coder do the unlock because it's actually cheaper for you because it's going to get unlocked naturally if it's executed as a single transaction and so if there's a lazy coder that wants to save the gas by not unlocking it then if this does go into a batch system and that lazy coders code lands here, it's basically going to be locked for the whole batch, not just that one transaction. And it'll just end up with these interesting little collisions, basically. Right. Yeah. It's, um, I, I don't know, like, I, I definitely see where they're coming from on it. Um, because, you know, developers do stupid things sometimes, yep. right? But, um, yeah, it was like at this point, it was like, okay, this thing has been under discussion for like so long. And and it was to the point that like genuinely, I mean, we, we have like, we have like support chats. It was like 1153 support chat where we all just kind of like <laughs> go in there and we vent about this and we like try and it's figure out like, what are we going to do about this. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it was it was weird, right? And it was to the point where like I was genuinely discussing with one or two other people, like we should just launch an L2. And the only difference from the EVM is that it has transient storage. Right, we just call it T-Chain or something, right? Because like we just we wanted like you know we wanted to like experiment with this, right? That's that's the, that's the difficulty with a lot of this is like there's not really like like yeah we have some like high level like heuristics that we can we can you know build around this, but like we don't know how people are going to use this until it's in the wild. We didn't know that people were going to dirty up storage and contracts just to free it during a gas war to get like discounts, right? Like you, there's just some things that you're not going to predict, and so you have to put these things into the wild so we can try it out. Um, I think that's such so, a good yeah. lesson though. Like you almost have to just put it into the wild sometimes and show that it is going to work or it's not going to work. Like the, the discussion can only go on for so long. And obviously when we're about to ship something like, you know, a, a spaceship that has to go orbit the earth, we have to be very careful with a lot of things, but eventually we got to put something up in the sky and see what happens. Right. 
yeah yeah so it's it was it was a lot of uh yeah it was a lot of really really interesting discussion came out of that and like huge respect it, it was really funny too because whenever i started posting about this like who is this guy like why is he sitting here like shitting on our eip like it's so late in the process we've had these discussions before you know but like the shit posting game was really good it really was yeah. like eventually we were like man this guy's actually like pretty funny you know he's a cool dude and so um you know we've kind of we've kind of had like our, our sort of like makeup arc right on on twitter you know since then like because yeah, he's a really smart guy he's um you know he's a huff dev he does this like call data compression stuff for like their their kind of try. they're actually building a competitor to 4237 by the way um, cool. i think it's 5089 i'll have to double check that but um cool. yeah just kind of like a, a similar similar system there uh, one sec i i think oh, this uh, uh yeah definitely post it up and, and we can share i think this really transitions nicely we we've kind of seen uh we've kind of discussed basically kind of both sides of you have this idea. Well, first of all, standards are super important. Standards need to happen because everything is open source and composable. We need to kind of speak the same language. So once we speak the same language, then everything kind of is composable in all these other different places. If we have an NFT and we know how to get the metadata for that NFT and who, who, do, who the owner is, these standards are very important. So standardizing or coming up with an idea is very important that everyone can get around. And there's this official process, but the official process is so hard and it takes so long and there's gigabrains, but there's also shit posters and there's psyops and there's all this other stuff going on, even beyond just the technical discussion that you have to wade through to get something to become at least, you know, visible to folks in the ecosystem and eventually Lindy. But then there's this other side where you could do it the wrong way and kind of uh, like steamroll it through and somehow meme it into existence without going through the traditional route. Uh, but then there's also this, I'm a new builder and I have this idea and I think this is good, but I don't have enough context for the space yet. So what I'm gonna do is just post this up and see if I can get some comments. And in a space with all the other stuff that we just discussed, when a new person comes in and says, hey, I would love to hear about this, you know, get some comments on this new thing I'm thinking of. Like, first of all, there's crickets, like no one gives a shit. And, and second of all, like it's almost usually just people shitting on it or just people telling you that you haven't looked at X or Y yet and you haven't done your research and you need to get context. But this isn't, this is really not a very open, you know, there's, there's, obviously forums and ETH research and lots of places where you can go as an outlet to post your thing, but there's really not a very like open nurturing, mentoring kind of landing spot for new people. And what they almost need is like someone to be like, okay, this is good, but it needs to go on the shelf and you need to throw it away and you need to not be so in love with it. And you need to try something new a couple times to get context. But with all of this, knowing all of this, knowing how hard it is to get through the, the EIP process, knowing that there's psyops and all this other stuff in the EIP process, knowing that there are smart people coming in trying to contribute, but they have this hard wall that they run into. What do we do as an ecosystem? Like what, what is the right way to bring JT Riley in next time? <laughs> Man, that's a tough one. <laughs> that's a really tough one. It's um yeah like i think the forums are good for the formal discussion and things like that but i think like in a sense um you know this this system that we're trying to build exists within the context of like the way that we communicate right like twitter is like an integral part of ethereum's development as much as i hate to say that right 100 percent. um you know i imagine like ethereum being developed like you know a decade or two ago would probably be like um, you know, quite a bit different, right? Like the processes yep. would be a lot different. So um, it's, it's, it's really tricky. It's really hard to say. I, I think probably like one of the, one of the highest leverage things for like newer people coming in to do if they're really trying to like build something new and like, not just like launch a product, but actually like, you know, start these movements and start to create like new things that can actually like impact a lot of people. Um, I think a lot of it is just like reach out, you know, reach out to these devs that are that are working on the high speed stuff uh, because they're they're like way more reachable than you'd think, right? Like we're we're not like, you know, these these guys are not like high caliber celebrities or anything like that, right? Like we're all in like group chats together, we all hang out together, right? Um, and like we're always happy to see like you know the the Huff Hackathon was actually like a great example of this where you know we hosted this hackathon a while back for people that just wanted to write Huff, 
and we kind of like really like personally i expected like you know okay it's an erc20 but it's like crazy fast right or you know something like that but um we had some pretty wild projects just pop up out of the blue like names that i'd never seen before are building like you know fully homomorphic encryption things and like zk verifiers nope. right and like nope. um somebody even did p256 right which allows yep. you to do like signing with like apple's enclave but like then it's like validated through a huff contract like really efficiently right so um, by the way do you, you think know, the just, nsa owns the uh the other side of that curve or whatever owns the toxic waste or whatever isn't there like a like a rumor that the r1 curve <laughs> is somehow backdoored what, what how do you feel um, about that as a gigabrain i think i think it's possible i think that um I mean, right now there's not like a ton of a ton of um, like crypto like hinging on that, and so there's not much of an incentive to like do this. If there was a backdoor and we there was some like known thing, right? Um, the bounty like, will no grow way, and grow. Yeah, yeah. Like there's no way that that would just stay under wraps forever, right? And there's just you know the NSA isn't perfect. Like they've had tools leaked before and things like this, right? Like I don't, I don't know. I think I think the odds of like that that being the case and this not getting mass exploited. You know, I, I don't, I don't think it's like super likely, but I never like write it off, right? Like your threat model has to center around like who, you, who do you actually care about like hiding from, right? It's easy to hide from CT. You're not hiding from the NSA, right? Like that's just, it's not happening. So it's, it's a, it's a matter of threat model. I think if you need something that like you know absolutely cannot be thwarted by NSA, then like you better learn to roll your own crypto or like find some pretty obscure Ooh. algorithms out there. Oh wow. Yeah. I don't, I don't think you want to be rolling your own crypto either. Yeah, <laughs> in general, definitely the don't. NSA. Definitely don't. <laughs> Yeah. Neat. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. So many awesome conversations here. Uh, the, the last piece I have in my notes, I think is we're going to go way back. I want to go way back to starting JT Riley in my notes you wrote. And, uh, when we were looking at the show notes, uh, Zach, my, uh, producer here was like, how deep is this going to go? How dark is this going to go? So this may be the darkest question, but, uh, in my notes, it says it was learn to program or die. And I kind of want to know where where you were at that moment and what was going on in your life and maybe advice for other builders that may be actually kind of close to that right now. Yeah, so whenever I got into programming, I had I'd left the casino industry. This was not long after the COVID, COVID crisis happened. Um, already, I kind of got stiffed on like the crisis payments for the COVID lockdowns. Um, so I was already pretty short on money. I'd pretty much blown through like all of my savings. I was blowing through the last of like, you know, what I had in a 401k. Um, I was very far away from home. Um, my car was like breaking down. Like I, my parents couldn't help. Like my family couldn't help. I didn't have very many friends because I'd like moved places. And, you know, it's hard to keep up with people when you move. I hadn't made a lot of new friends in a new place yet. Um, and it was just like this alignment of, of scenarios where like, you know, I, I like something had to change, right? Like I was running out of money and I had no way to get back home. I had no idea where to get help from. Right. Um, and, and I was taking care of somebody else as well at the time. Um, and so it, yeah, it was like this really tight situation of like, what do I do? Like I have to do something now, something has to change. And so like, at first I was actually doing some, like trying like a few different things, like, um, like trying to get like a, the drone commercial pilot license thing. Um, to, you know, maybe get some money from that. And, you know, eventually like turns out that test is like crazy hard um, and takes like a ton of time to study for. Huh. So I was like, okay, maybe programming, right? Like people have talked about programming before. Maybe I'll like, just give it a shot. See, um, you know, see if it's something worth my time. And so it was literally like, like I, I worked. So at the time I worked at um, like a restaurant, like a, like a brunch place and like scraping tables, $5 an hour, you know, bleeding runway. Um, I already didn't have much runway as it was, you know, um and yeah like every every minute that i was like not at work i was coding right like i was at home i was looking at youtube tutorials i was learning html css javascript right i was like i mean i would spend like you know maybe six hours at work or like you know five five six hours at work and then i would spend like eight hours like coding right like i would code until it's time to go to sleep i wake up the next morning i like code a little bit before i go in the work you know, and, and like, while I was at work, I actually got to the point where I was, I was like writing HTML with like pen on napkins, right? Of like ideas <laughs> that I had and trying to like, you know, iterate, right? Because I was like, I have to get a job and something has to change right now. Um, and so like, I, I kept going at that, kept going at that. And um, it was, it was really, really bad. And I got to a point where like, I was making a little bit of money from like tiny little side projects, nothing that was like sustainable at all. Um, and 
God, I can't even remember exactly how it played out now, but um, you know, I was, I was in a tight spot and I was, I was, I ended up working back at, at Starbucks for a little while. And I, I got to this point where like, I was just fed up with it. I was like, okay, like I, I'm literally like wasting my time at this job right now, instead of like doing this code thing. And like, I know that I'm close. I know that it will only take like getting on somebody's radar. Like I've got some projects now and, and I quit my job. I took a, I took a big risk and it was pretty, it was pretty damn scary. Right. Like I, I wasn't really sure what I would have done if, if I didn't, you know, pull through with a job like pretty soon, but I, I quit that job. I had maybe a couple of weeks of runway and I just like coded as much as I could and ended up picking up, uh, ended up picking a job from, you know, turns out that poker dealer had a connection with a guy in a FinTech company where it was like a startup that had gotten acquired by like a larger corporation that had then gotten acquired by like a giant corporation. Um, and so the culture shift was too much, too many people left. And they're like, we need warm bodies to write react native code right now. And so I was like, all right, I started. And you know, that was, that was it. That was the starting of the programming career, but it was a, it was a, it was a tight margin for a little while there. I was pretty, I was pretty scared, you know, but that motivation is what like got me into the space. And like, in a sense, like that actually affected the way that I coded for a long time. Like it, I've kind of like, found a balance now because burnout is a very real thing and it will destroy your career if you're not careful about it. But um, yeah, it was like for the longest time, I would just continue to code all the time because it was all I knew, right? Like it was like all I was doing. I had no hobbies anymore. I wasn't playing video games anymore. I wasn't like, you know, I wasn't going out and touching grass, right? It was like, I would, I would code for work and then I would not even come home. It was like remote work, right? So it's like, I would, I would code at work and then I would code at home. And I would just like, back and forth. Sometimes I would have both laptops open at the same time, jumping back and forth when I could, you know, like it's, that was like a pretty integral part of my life for, for a very long time. And I think a lot of it is just derived straight from like that, that situation of like, you know, you have to code right now or like you're going to be homeless. Right. Like it was, is yeah, it was scary, but it was a good motivator. Heck yeah. That's a good story. That's tough, man. That's, and I know there are a lot of builders out there in the same situation. Uh, I know some of them personally and it's, it's gotten a little easier with chat GPT. I'll say that like your YouTube videos that you were following, you were going line by line, learning that stuff to get the syntax the first time. And now you can kind of be like, yo, chat GPT, how do I make this component? And it's a little more helpful, but yes, that is, that is such a battle and hearts out to all the builders out there that are in the same position right now. Like keep building, keep shipping. Uh, definitely st like stop asking people for permission to build the thing and go build the thing and get it in front of them. And crypto Twitter is oh, obviously <laughs> it's bad, but it's sad that that is like a key like information point, but that's where you'll find the folks that will discover you and, and see the stuff that you're building and, and encourage you. So just keep building, keep shipping uh, and get it out in front of people. Awesome. I think that's, I think that's our episode. I think we did it. Thank you, JT Riley. Uh, anything, anything else that you would like to say to the builder community or anything we can close on, um, that's on your mind? Um, I do think, yeah, what, you know, sort of as a, as a closing note, um, because I know that like, I'm nowhere near the only person that's kind of struggling with like seeing how narratives are shifting, seeing how, um, you know, people are buying like racist Solana coins, right? People are kind of just, um, you know, slinging money in every direction except for the direction of the builders. And, um, you know, just know that like, I feel you, I get it. It's, it's, it sucks, but like, keep on keeping on, right? Like, you know, like, like I've said before, like you, like the biggest thing is just stay in the game. Like your product, if it is something that's genuinely good, it's something that genuinely helps the space, it solves problems, like, somebody will pick it up eventually just make sure you're in the game long enough to like see that through right make sure you're around whenever people start to give you recognition for what you build because people will recognize it so um keep your hopes up keep building oh yeah man thanks let me show one more time if you want to get started just go to speedrunethereum.com really great place to get a lot of the concepts quickly uh from from there you'll maybe use scaffoldy 2 or some other tool maybe you'll dive straight into huff it's totally up to you uh and, and then look look to us for grants also build guild is trying to fund lots of people uh similar to jt riley here uh we're trying to set them up for success and let them be free agents as long as they can before they get captured by by vcs and all the other wild stuff but vcs are good too 
Uh, one last shout out to JT Riley. Thank you so much for being here for Bowtie Friday. Keep building, keep doing things, keep shit posting. You're you're an amazing uh, uh, influence on the space, sir. See, please stay around and keep doing it. Thank you so much, man. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Have a good one.